writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. In this episode, we are going to talk about Longfellow and creating legends in your stories. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host and producer, David Allen Lucas, creator of Crazy Things, voice actor, author, president of St. Louis Writers Guild, as well, of course, of Winding Trails Media. And currently, if you have been missing it, because I know that we record in the past, um, there is a new vlog up under Winding Trails. It's just about my journey as a writer. You can find it on YouTube, and you can find it on my personal website, davidallenlucas.com. It's about not only as a writer, but also as a voice actor, martial artist, and just thoughts and inspirations. And with that, also with me today is, of course, my one and only lovely co-host. Hi, I'm Kathleen Kayembe. I write speculative fiction. You can find my work on nightmaremagazine.com and on lightspeedmagazine.com. And uh, coming up in April in a Best of 2017 anthology by Jason Stratham. Hooray! Um, and uh, I'm really excited because I got asked to write my first short story on spec for a magazine. So yay! That was oh, wow. for me. Congrats! Very good. Yay. And, and well deserved. <laughs> And also with us, I'm going to need to come up with a great female artist to go reference you all the time with. I'm always coming up with Da Vinci or Dantello. And, eh. Yeah, we need a female. Is the curse of being a lady in history. Oh, well, no. how about Georgia O'Keeffe? Do you? There you go. Work, I love O'Keeffe. Georgia? I don't draw nearly enough <laughs> vagina flowers to be Georgia O'Keeffe. I'm glad they said it, because I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, is our art is our artist and illustrator in? Children's author in residence. In residence, I, I will draw a lot of cow skulls to be Georgia O'Keeffe. Okay. okay. Um, my name is Jennifer Solzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. I promised the audience that by now I would have another short story out, but I got epically ill for the pretty much entirety of December, and it was great fun, and I got nothing done. So <laughs> that's a thing that happened, and that's why I've been absent for a lot of episodes because I was croaking like a frog the entire time. So. Uh, I have a short story coming out, hopefully soon, hopefully by the time this airs, I'll have Earth Curse out, and in which case you need to be looking forward to a, a compilation publication from me in summer that will have all of these short stories under one roof with some bonus content, including concept art, deleted scenes from Threadcaster, which is my fantasy novel, find it on Amazon, and additional writings that are uh, yet unpublished and unwritten, but don't tell anybody about that. And also with us is the Madame of Murder. Fedora Amos. I ride Victorian whodunits like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis and Mayhem at Buffalo Bills Wild West. And just today I finally got the contract for Have Your Ticket Punched by Frank James. So I tell you what, I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm planning to get them in the mail tomorrow. And I will tell you when they send the finalized version back to me. So you can get some idea of how long this friggin' business takes. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings up a conversation later about, I talked to um, my cousin about her romance novels. I think it's good that you're going to be giving yeah. us a perspective on that. Because I, not a lot of people know about that. Yes. And also with us is the master pirate of steampunk himself. You're... Ooh, a pirate now. I like it. Yeah, master, master pirate. Author of the Iron Chronicles. Uh, but that, that trilogy is now complete, so do check out uh, Steam Tree, uh, which is my middle grade. So if you've got any young steampunk fans out there, but as of now, probably is the time you're listening to this, you can check out the brand new series, Tales of the Gear Blade, uh, which is a really kick butt sword uh, that is also steampunky. Uh, but check it out. The first episode is absolutely free, you can find it all over the place. Uh, and definitely on my website, which is bradartcook.com. So, Brad, are those, is um, gear, 
Gear sword. Um, gear blade. Uh, gear blade. Thank gear you. Gear, the gear, gear sword. I apologize. Is the Chinese knockoff of gear uh, blade. Yes, yes. I apologize greatly. <laughs> um, is that going to be? Is it a serial or is it? Yes, you'll be able to catch uh, new episodes uh, probably every month, maybe every five weeks. But no, no, no. We'll say every month because that's fun. Uh, for the next foreseeable future, and then once all the episodes are out, it'll come out as a giant book and all that kind of fun stuff. But uh, read the first episode for free, so check it out. Excellent. Neat. And today we are going to talk about Longfellow, and we're also going to talk about creating legends. Because Longfellow was known for creating many of the American legends, and I'm going to turn this over to Fedora to go into a little more detail on that aspect. Did you forget Ryan? Ryan no, is Ryan not on. Is no oh, Ryan's on. on. Okay. Ryan was going to be on, but unfortunately he's having technical issues and he was starting to sound <laughs> like, I, this, yes, yeah. hi. Yeah. Yeah. He, I was uh, wondering if he did that on purpose. No. Uh, his umbilical no? Okay. to his satellite station <laughs> is a little bit weird in the weather, so yeah. Space Ryan will not be joining us today. <laughs> Well, let me give you a little background on Longfellow. Longfellow was important in writing from around the Civil War, from the 1830s to about the 1880s, though he largely ignored the Civil War as far as I'm concerned. He is considered one of the fireside poets or the schoolroom poets. Now, why the schoolroom poets? Because he was the poet that teachers used to introduce students to poetry for the next century. I'm not <laughs> kidding at all. The next century, from about 1850 to 1950. And in that time period, understand that we are talking about a time there was no radio, no television, no motion pictures. Families would gather around at night and read aloud to one another to entertain each other. People would play the piano or the violin, have dances, would have contests of three-legged races or horse races. People had to make their own entertainment is what I'm saying here. And Archaic one, time. <laughs> one of the ways that they did that, in addition to singing songs and making music, was recitation. This is true not only in the United States, but elsewhere also. And there were two very important poems that even boys who wouldn't practice enough and didn't have any talent would be forced to do by their parents because culture was prized. It seriously was. And you could not get it outside of reading or doing it yourself. The two poems were in Britain, Invictus, which praises the unconquerable soul. It says, Live up, save up to everything that you are, never give in, never surrender, <laughs> and the kind of thing that uh, Mr. Churchill said much later on. <laughs> that didn't think Longfellow wrote that. I'm going to he did that. not. No, okay, that thank was you. Henley. Thank you. I was no. like, that's one of my, that is that was my the defining poem. Okay. okay. And in the United States, that poem that farm boys even were forced to memorize was the village blacksmith. The village blacksmith is shown as a very noble creature. Why? Not because he is a lord, not because he has political strings to pull, but because he is a hard-working, laboring man. He is a John Henry kind of fellow who works hard and goes to church. Those are the <laughs> virtues that Longfellow espoused, and throughout his career, he created an American mythology to equalize our importance in the world. You see, the other countries, the countries of Europe that had culture and were worthy of emulating had their own mythologies. In England, King Arthur. In other places, it would be the ancient Romans or the Vikings. We really didn't have anything until Longfellow came along and pointed the way. 
And the first big epic hit, and I'm talking about a poem here that is book length, hmm. is The Courtship of Miles Standish. Hmm. Who would know anything about Miles Standish had it not been for that poem? <laughs> I didn't even know he was a real person. He was a real person. But he is certainly mythologized and lionized in the courtship of Miles Standish. I'll let somebody else talk a while. Who is Miles and then I'll come in and contradict everybody. Go I, ahead. Had, I had to say, I, I was going to say, who is Miles Standish? You have to tell us about Miles Standish now. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's Brad's job. Brad, tell us oh, about Miles Standish. I have Standish. no idea who Miles Standish is, but I will tell you this. He was the Harry Potter of his day. The Courtship of Miles Standish sold 10,000 copies exactly. in London in a single day. Wow. wow. That is impressive. He was a <laughs> uh, pilgrim and uh, a shy guy who had a problem getting a uh, getting to uh, see his, his love Priscilla, mm -hmm. and so we get somebody else, a la Cyrano, to Cyrano de in, intervene yeah. for him, and, and you know, it's... Yeah. it's go like, read the poem. I got, go, right. yeah, go read the poem. Um, one of the things still I want to bring up about Longfellow, that before we get into talking about legends beyond what we just did, um, Brad, you pointed out something that about Longfellow and his life. Um, we always, we tend to celebrate authors on their birthdays, or their, our what we call wake, wake days, months anyway, here on Right Pack Radio, but sometimes we don't talk about what some of the tragedies that happen to authors. And Brad, in this case here, um, his wife? Well, his first wife died in childbirth, so that is sad. And yes. Or, uh, died of a miscarriage, actually, so after, yeah. it wasn't childbirth, she died after a miscarriage. Ooh, no <laughs> wife and no child. But his second wife, Frances Appleton, died in 1861 after sustaining burns when her dress caught fire. And if you don't know uh, the Victorian age, like uh, I'm sure Fedora uh, and myself have seen, um, <laughs> the Victorian dresses were actually quite the fire traps, uh, could be, due to the, uh, the massive amounts of bustling underneath and the fact that some of them were so big that you couldn't fit through doors. Um, so they, they were, uh, there's a whole bunch, you know, lit candles are all over the place and this kind of thing. So it, it's actually a tragedy that, thank goodness, has been rectified. No one needs their clothes catching on fire all the time. I'm grateful. Really, but yeah, really he did see tragedy. And in fact, those were, the top, were two of the top three reasons why Victorian women die prematurely. Fire mm -hmm. being one, and childbirth being one, and the most common was, of course, disease. Right. Mm. We have conquered so much of all three. Yes. It's amazing. I'm sitting here wearing pants, being grateful for the 21st century. <laughs> Are we done with heels yet, though? Are we done with heels yet? I don't have to wear them if I don't want to, so I'm going to say yeah. All right. I leave that up to the ladies' choices. Hey, anyway. some men wear heels, too, you know. I like that. Yeah. I do. Um, Thank you, so, man. Creating legends. Now, as you just described earlier with um, Longfellow, he basically, he created, or he... Mythological, mythologic, mythologic. Thank you. I can get the word out right. Um, a lot of American culture. Yes, indeed. Uh, take another one that is Evangeline, which is about the uh, Acadians being ousted from what is now Lower Canada and part of the United States, and they had to go down to what is now Lafayette County, Louisiana, Lafayette Parish, Louisiana, mm -hmm. and become Cajuns. Okay, so this too was not only a, a mythology that is created completely unto itself and completely American, he also was brilliant at marketing such things, which is just amazing. The original Evangeline was in a limited edition and, and it was published in between yellow boards. If you could get your hands on one of those today, it would be worth a spectacular amount of money. <laughs> So what can we learn from Longfellow to create our own legends? I mean, a lot of our own stories, be it um, fiction to mysteries to science fiction to horror, fantasy, etc., we tend to create legends. We also create, if you write historical especially, or if you have anybody historical involved in your stories, you create legends as well. So you take legends, go for it. Well, um, I was 
to, to connect it to that, um, we're often told that stories, like good stories, are, are about people, characters who are larger than life in some way. Right. Like a great character is someone who's larger than life in some way. And is that the same sort of thing that Longfellow did? That, did he make people seem larger than life? Or is, is this kind of mythologizing of real figures on an entirely different level? No, I think that's exactly what it is. Take, for example, one of his most famous poems, which is once again a book-length poem, which is uh, The Song of Hiawatha, mm -hmm. in which a real person named Hiawatha, an Indian, had gained some local kind of publicity, I dare say, though I don't know what it was, but in Longfellow's hands, it became a true legend of the noble Indian, which is something we still believe in and still love, I do believe, and I think he was the beginning of that mythological process. He certainly created a trope anyway. Yes. He did. And the real Hiawatha, from what we know of history, was involved in creating the Iroquois Confederacy or the Iroquois League, which, by the way, their form of government influenced our Constitution. Yeah, Iroquois so. are very interesting, you know, yeah. that the Iroquois women could uh, put the kibosh <laughs> on war. No. Yeah. Because they controlled the purse strings, quite literally, and would not give supplies to the Braves if they wanted to go on the war path when the women didn't want to. <laughs> I love that. And so, a, and so another was, that's member part of, of my name, Amos. Another, and I is for yeah. ear oh, Another yeah. part yeah. of that of that league was the people who gave us Mohawks. Was the Mohawk? They were the war. They were a warrior tribe. By the way, they didn't wear Mohawks like what we do. What we see punk people wearing on big peacock ones. No, they, they kept it very short because people didn't want grab. They didn't want people grabbing their hair in combat. Anyway, we digress. So, I digressed us. No, oh, I did too. Yeah, so, creating something larger than life, taking something that may have existed or did exist and creating a legend around that. How? I'm, play, I'm playing the cabbage head, but how do you go about creating that? How do you do that? Are you sure you didn't ask that question so you didn't have to answer first? Because that's what I was doing. <laughs> I don't want to answer that question first. <laughs> I'm like, good at that. I'm good at, I'm not, I'm pleading the fifth. It. I'm an American. I'll answer it first. Um, how you go about creating a character that's larger than life is mm -hmm. the same, one of the reasons why you sample characters from the real world. Do you have to give them a depth and scope that makes them exist outside just the pages of your story? So if your book was like a window, if we were playing myths, talk about modern myths. Myths, one of the most influential PC games of the 20th century. Um, if you opened a book and saw a window into another world, uh, an epic character is one that would exist beyond the frame of that. That you get the idea that they have had adventures aside from the one you're reading, and they will have more adventures after, assuming they survive, and that their influence on the world that they're in is beyond just what you're looking at. That's how you get an epic character. Not, you know, this, you can have epic in the terms of, you know, he's super strong and he's super big, but when it, to have it feel epic is one that feels like it's got meat enough for multiple people to, to, to take him and run. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think Fedora's Fedora. first. Fedora. I, I'm not sure that even matters. Take, for example, <laughs> Frank and Jesse James, which I've been researching for. Have your ticket punk by Frank James. Uh -huh. <laughs> a lot of people would just say that they robbed trains and they robbed beds, which, of course, they did. What then made them mythological characters that go beyond that simple thing and turn them into folk heroes? And I can tell you what it is. It's a fellow named Johnson who worked for the Kansas City Star and wrote article after article after article praising them until they became well-known. So the pen is certainly mightier than the, the gun <laughs> in those legends of Frank and Jesse James. Brad? Uh, I think with all of these, it's exaggeration of certain aspects of certain people that creates the legend that is larger than life and what we then look towards. So you can take anyone from any walk of life or any job, whether it be you know something we already consider awesome and huge or something 
we consider a dirty job that you know Mike Rowe would talk about on TV or something. Ah. And you can find the aspects that you then can exaggerate and you know kind of make a caricature out of and then that is where you would then base your legends off of uh you know same thing with like billy the kid or you know frank and jesse james or any of these kind of people uh john henry or any of these uh that you're you're taking an aspect of a person and exaggerating it out which is why so often in myth uh is nowhere near reality and you can see that um almost in every culture that there is from the Japanese story of a tale of Genji, to um, Viking myth, Viking sagas, to the Old West here in America, of course, as you just kind of, we, as you and Fedora hit on, of course, the James brothers. Um, you have Pinkertons, which did exist and still does exist now as a company, but um, what the Pinkertons did. Um, Samuel Bass. Sam, oh yes. I salute that man. And then also, too, of course, um, Wild Bill Hickok and all that. A lot of times what we know of the Old West was put into book form by people who really didn't know what was going on out there. Or, just or didn't on care. Or didn't care. Because it, well, if, yeah. if you're printing a legend or the truth, which one should you print? The legend. Yeah, the legends. That was the You'll sell more copies. by word. Yep. You'll sell lots more copies. <laughs> to, to borrow from one of my favorite authors, who, I've, as I've been thinking, well, anyway, that's a whole other sidebar. Um, <laughs> Earl Stanley Gardner is, don't let the, I'm paraphrasing this, don't let the truth stand in the way of good story. Exactly. So. This should not be taken as advice for journalism. <laughs> yes, certainly. Yes, no, no, no. Yeah. Journalism no needs to thing. unlearn that this story. Is journalism is not fiction, mm -hmm. or it is not supposed it to. It shouldn't be fiction. Shouldn't yes. be. Mythology is fiction. <laughs> yes. You know, I, I don't honestly think a whole lot of Longfellow as a poet, and it was in his big epic poems that he sold millions of copies and made a great fortune and made a big name, and was a cultural influence way beyond his lifetime. But I will give the man his due. He was brilliant. He knew a number of languages and was a modern language teacher at Harvard University. Mm -hmm. He translated Dante, and he was, I think, n nobody does better what he did in terms of rhyme and meter. His is just friggin' perfect. And that is something remarkable, too, especially when he did such very long poems. And they have little, little pithy bits of interest as well. Here's one from a Psalm of Life. Lives of great men all remind us we can make ourselves sublime. And departing, leave behind us footprints in the sands of time. You recognize that last line? Mm -hmm. You should. He has plenty of lines that are very quotable, and we still quote them today. Myself and then Brad's going to be next. Um, very briefly, you said earlier when we began that, this, that Longfellow's poems were the introduction to poetry, if you will, and kids had to repeat them up into the 1950s, more or less, um, in education. I really wish, especially a poem like that, would have been what I would have been required to have learned to recite in seventh grade, rather than the song that I had to recite in seventh grade, which was a theme song to MASH. <laughs> now, if you don't know what the theme song to MASH is... Suicide is painless? Suicide is painless. <laughs> and that's a seventh grade, seventh grade choir class I had to sing. And the opening verse is... Through early morning fog I see visions of the things to be, the pains that are withheld from me. Oh, now my mind just went blank. But anyway, you get the idea where that's going. So, with that, Brad. <laughs> that was dangerous. Yeah, no, um, yeah, no kidding. Uh, so, uh, not to throw any shade at Longfellow or anything like that, but uh, part of the reason he was such a genius and made such a ton of money is because not all of his stuff was actually... Uh, uh, he wrote a lot of travel books, let's say that. He wrote <laughs> poetry, tra like travel poetry. So he's got an entire book of uh, poetry about places. Um, and these sold like crazy because people didn't travel uh, in, in his age. So if you wanted to know about a place, you read about a place. And so he made tons of money writing essentially nonfiction 
Um, so it, it's he's kind of brilliant for his day. I totally give him credit for that. But you know, a lot of what he wrote was actually what we would consider, you know, to be like travel blogs or things of that nature, which is kind of fascinating and cool. Uh, so much so, and I'm going to throw it out right now, the epic shade that Emerson threw upon him. Um, oh, dang it, I lost it. Hold on one second. <laughs> so, so, uh, All I right, guess here it is. Uh, the epic shade from Emerson uh, to Longfellow. The world is expecting better things of you than this. You're wasting time that should be uh, should be bestowed upon original production. Yeah. And he said that of Poems of Places, which uh, Longfellow put out in 1874. You don't think he could have been jealous at Longfellow's success, do you? Oh, Emerson? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Um, yeah. In fact, he did write a few good poems. If anybody wants to read a poem that I think is good by Longfellow, read Moonlight. It's a short lyric piece which uh, talks about the moonlight, but also the shadows that it throws and how that distorts your judgment and that it suggests that there are shadows beyond what moonlight throws that cloud our judgment. And I think that's a pretty darn good message for today, mm -hmm. too. So, with that, with legends and so forth, what, and then this doesn't have to be a long fellow, are there any legends that affect what you write? That's loaded. I know it is. I have loaded questions. That's super I'm not a, loaded. I'm not a lawyer in a courtroom. Well, Frank right. and Jesse James, if I could say myself uh, repeatedly uh -huh. again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jack the Ripper is another. Yeah. Um, and Wild Bill Hick? Uh, not Wild Bill Hick. Buffalo Bill. Buffalo Bill. Buffalo Bill Cole. So, um, for You Will Always Have Family a Triptych, I was using Congolese legends, well, and mythology and tales, folk tales, um, about witches. So it's not a specific person, but it is definitely something everybody knows and uh, is aware of and wary of. Me? Jen and then Brad? Oh, well, Threadcaster is heavily influenced by uh, Judeo-Christian mythology, but also, uh, I guess it's, it's not really a myth, more historical, but the, the events of the... Um, the Protestant Reformation, mm. and that sort of thing. So that's stuff that I was raised knowing and stuff I find interesting. So when I went to plot something out, they definitely influenced the way I built my villains and the way I built my heroes. Brad? Uh, if you read Iron, the Iron Chronicles, uh, it is obvious that uh, I based them heavily on Alexander the Great and the mythologies that surround Alexander the Great. Um, Steam Tree is less so based, but if you read it, there's a whole Arthurian thing that runs through it um, that is kind of a general theme. But the one I really want to talk about is the one I'm writing right now, uh, which is the History of St. Louis Writers Guild, where I am essentially mythologizing uh, much of the early uh, people who started the organization. Um, I, I feel almost uh, that I am in some ways, because I'm not really telling their whole stories, I'm just telling this really glossy bit about the awesomeness they did for St. Louis Writers Guild. Hmm. That it, it, a lot of times it feels like uh, creating some sort of new mythology, uh, like a Writers Guild mythology, if there is such a thing. So uh, it's, it's, it's an intriguing done. thing to be able to do. Well, in all honesty, and this is not what I, what I was going to say next, um, I'm going to dovetail to you first, and that is a lot of organizations have their own mythology that gets created. Um, let me borrow from Boy Scouts for a second. If you don't know, um, Baden Powell, who was fighting in the Boer Wars, wrote a bunch of books. Or wrote um, the Scout the Scout's Guide, or I may have the name of the book incorrectly in my head, but that's basically what it was was a scouting guide because all his fresh troops basically didn't know how didn't know squat about how to live off the land, <laughs> and that was what they were in the situation of. And he was losing a lot. Well, it turned out that book got published back in London and a bunch of boys got their hands on it and fell in love with it and Baden Powell comes back to being a war hero and he starts Boy Scouts. That's the short version. And if anybody wants to know, from what I understand, his wife started Girl Scouts. Anyway, then the legend goes that for Boy Scouts of America, a, 
Oh, the name just left my head. Of course it did. Whenever I want to talk about this. Um, basically, a travel, an American traveler in London gets lost in the fog, has no idea where he's going, and a boy guides him. The, the man, the American, wants to give him a, a reward. And the boy, the boy says, "No, I'm part of Boy Scouts, and this is my good deed for the day." <laughs> and that sparks the whole interest and brings it over here. So, and you've got other organizations that have got their own legends as well. Um, what I was going to say instead of that dovetail is something I've been playing with. I'm not sure if it's going to show up in the current fiction of, I'm working on or not. Um, is I've been playing with some Japanese mythology. Especially the Kairin. Um, the Kairin is a very ugly creature. Physically ugly. Um, it is basically, if you would, imagine a dragon had sex with a unicorn. The only thing, the, yeah. <laughs> the only thing though is... It, well, it would never hurt any living thing or any good person. It was, a good, it was a sign of good luck if it showed up to you, if face-to-face, if you're a good person. It would destroy all evil, including it was an evil dragon. It was more powerful than a dragon. And then there's the Karura, which is basically a bird man. I probably mispronounced that, but um, also would be is a protector and destroyer of evil. And it would kill all dragons, eat all dragons, unless they followed the concept of Buddha. So that's the legend short version. Also, too, I've played with the real legends of vampiri- vampires when I've written horror as well as um, ghost legends. And, yeah, I still remember one character I created that was based on a different kind of Scandinavian legend that was in that same story with the vampire. I really need to get back to that one. Over to you, Kathleen. Um, I was going to say that uh, I heard someone say, and I wish I remembered who said this, um, I heard someone say that um, the greatest American export is the American dream. (laughs) And that is the kind of legend that we have built about our country. Mm -hmm. It is the dream that if you come here, we are a meritocracy, and if you work hard, you can achieve anything you want. And that is something that um, a lot of people buy into when they choose to immigrate here. Um, And unfortunately, like a lot of Americans at this point are like, that is a myth too. That is not real. You can you can have whatever opinion you want about it, but um, we have myth- mythologies about our country. Just every country has you know something it wants every other place to think about them. And for America, mm-hmm. we want people to believe that we are the land of opportunity, and um, that if you come here and you work hard, you can achieve your dreams. Here's well, a, a section which says exactly that. It's from. Longfellow's A Ladder of St. Augustine. The heights by great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight, but they, while their companions slept, were toiling upward in the night. Hmm. Hmm. I will go with that. That's a good quote. Too bad I've already graduated. That'd be my senior quote. (laughs) But yeah, and that's actually how you get to success, is working your ass off and knowing you're going to fail at times, and getting up and doing it again. Borrow from Japanese. Fall seven times, get up eight. Borrow from Batman Begins. Why do we fall, Bruce? Why do we fall, Bruce? Why do we fall down, Bruce? Why do we fall? So we can get back up again or learn how to get back up again. Yes. I wish I could do a better uh, Michael Caine. Uh, Why do we fall, Bruce? Why do we fall? (laughs) Why do we fall? Okay. (laughs) Sorry. Sorry, we're done. We're done. We're all a little loopy here. Yeah. This is why I get forgiving a lot of people who are on the Today's Broadcast. Alcohol. We need, we need <laughs> to lose up before the broadcast yeah, goes Oh my god. Loosens up. So, anything else from Longfellow? Well, I have a final quote, which I think applies to all writers very well. It's from Nuremberg, which is a pro, uh, poem that Longfellow wrote about Albrecht Dürer, who did a lot of etchings. In mm-hmm. Gravit is the inscription on the tombstone where he lies. Dead he is not, but departed. For the artist never dies. <laughs> huh. And that is something which writers, at least I will say myself, want is to create that legacy. 
And that's why they just say your quote. Exactly. Oh my gosh, we want to we want to mythologize ourselves through our work. No, I, mean, I don't know about myth mythologizing myself. I just want my work to continue past my death. <laughs> Which means I need to get more, get more work out there. You need to finish something. I know. <laughs> I had, I've been I've been stuck. But you know what? I, in my own sidebar with that, I've been reading a book by Herman Woke, who I have turned around and realized how much this man has actually influenced some of what I write. Hmm. Um, and it's his autobiography, which is The Sailor and the Fiddler. The um, Hang on, I actually looked it up here. The, sa the sa Sailor and Fiddler, Reflections of a 100-Year-Old Author. Yeah, let's sort of know Herman Woke is still alive, and but he stopped writing finally. But he wrote Winds of War, War and Remembrance. And that took him forever just to get started. Because he kept falling down and restarting, falling down and restarting. And just listening to hit, reading his tales about how he writes or how he wrote. That and as well as Kane Mutiny and some other ones. Yeah, I don't feel as bad with some of my stops and starts anymore. Because I was really giving myself a guilt trip before that. So, we've talked a bit about making larger than life characters. We've talked a little bit about um, creating legendary characters. But what about creating legends in our own work? Because I know that... Um, for me, I write speculative fiction, mm -hmm. and I don't necessarily always write about this world. Or when I do write about this world, I've added an undercurrent of magic somewhere, because that's how I do. Mm -hmm. So the, the stories that I want to tell don't necessarily have legends that we have in our world. I want to create things like that. I want to create, you know, not just, you know... An entire pantheon potentially of gods and goddesses that no one on earth knows about or believes in anything like that but I want to create mythologies for those religions if I come up with them I want to create legendary people in cultures that we might not necessarily know about so how do I go about doing stuff like that I just don't tell there are authors out there who have created whole entire mythologies that are in their work and so for Tolkien is one. Yeah, he, right, he wanted to do something similar to what Longfellow did. He wanted to, Tolkien wanted to create um, a, a British myth, a European myth. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's one of the, the driving forces behind his creating Lord of the Rings. As you said to Frank Herbert. Dune. Exactly with Dune. George Lucas with Star Wars. And so forth. Um, the entire comic book industry. <laughs> yes, this is also true. It really is our entire Stan comic book Lee, industry. Yes. Stan Lee and everybody else who's been Debbie God of Heroes, Stan Lee. Yeah. Yes. But how do you do it? That's a good question. You like, create are... something so special and so unique that other people cotton to it. <laughs> that that doesn't help me though, because I mean, like, I mean, I want more concrete. Uh huh. Brad. Mm -hmm. I touched on this earlier. You're taking some aspect of of the character. And you're uh, blowing it up into bigger proportions. So take Harry Potter, which is uh, one of the modern mythoses uh, that's been kind of created. Harry Potter is a nothing more than a kid going to school. Uh, and we all read seven books uh, and went crazy for movies and did all that kind of fun stuff. And the reason is, is because uh, the, the myth that is created out of all of that is the magic elements that he brings into it. But then it's also that Harry himself is special. Uh, so in order to create a legend, you need to, uh, you know, kind of put a giant magnifying glass so that it blows up in even bigger terms what it is that makes that character so special. Jen. Well, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier about making characters that are bigger than the socks they're wearing. Um, the... If you're creating it for your own mythology, for your own book, uh, I'll use Threadcaster as an example since obviously I know that one inside and out having made it. Um, I have the characters who live presently, but every place you go, that place existed before your protagonist got there. And you can create legends based on who came before in certain regions that have nothing to do with your protagonist. 
you can create legends based on what your protagonist knows about the region they go to, or the people they meet, or the religion or philosophies that they run into. Um, Threadcaster has a whole story that's happening 500 years before my protagonist starts her adventure. And it plays into her adventure because it's part of why she's taking it and why the world is as it is, but it's not something that is, is happening actively in the story. But you can see it's that the event of that 500 years ago stuff is, is present in everything because it's, it ripples out throughout my entire world. Now, my world I've built is very, very small. Uh, everything essentially takes place in one crater on this planet. So uh, we can visit every corner of the known world in a week, which we do in the story. Um, but I, you have to, it took me 12 years to finish it because I spent 12 years thinking about, well, who's this person? Why did they found this town? Where are they, where's their roots based? And hopefully Kat is a legend, but really her adventure in the story is based on legends that she knows and that people she runs into knows within the scope of her world, which gives it a certain living breath to it that you know i'm not tooting my own horn you can please read threadcaster and tell me if i failed um but i would like to think that the world is big enough that it can have more adventures than just cat's adventure and i bet it bet so much on that that i've been writing short stories in the world for the last year hoping that these extra characters that we just meet for 40 pages mm -hmm. existing on this planet that i have built for the express purpose of having cat go on a road trip um, is strong enough to support all these little stories and make people interested in reading more about them and have them all feel coherent because they exist in the same place with the same roots. I'm going to come back a little bit to what you said in a moment. I'm going to talk about a completely different author, completely different character, and how this legend has influenced so many different real-life people and real careers in advancements of science. But hold that thought, Brad, you first, and then I'll come back to me. Yeah, uh, Jen's totally right. In fact, one of the uh, one of the great franchises that I think did this really brilliantly was the Avatar series, and I am talking about the uh, animated version. Of the <laughs> you gotta be specific. Uh, the Last Airbender, dudes. Yeah, Avatar The Last Airbender. So this uh, is a cartoon show that has... Uh, is fantasy, but is based in enough real world that you kind of wonder if it is real world, even though there's like flying uh, Sky Bison. Oppa. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sky Bison. Yes. Uh, so you have all these mythical creatures running around. You have all this stuff, but one of the reasons why it's epic is because every place has a deep, rich culture, a deep, rich mythology of its own, heroes and legends from the past. Uh, and then, you know, even the people who are in present day, like you take a look at Zuko or something like that, most likely in the future, uh, Zuko is going to be super famous as, you know, Fire Lord and all that kind of stuff too. So he's going to be, a, it's a modern myth forming. But even beyond that, you have all the old avatars that keep coming back up. And each one of the villages, you know, like loves Avatar Kiyoshi and her village, you know, still honors her to this day. And in doing so, in doing building all of this up and building this giant, you know, kind of putting each new layer on top, you end up with a super rich world that, you know, people like me go nuts for and will watch a cartoon over and over and over and over again, even though it's like umpteen episodes long, because it is that rich and diverse and you can pick things up with each new, uh, you know, time you go through it. I'm going to yield for a moment. I'm going to turn over to Kathleen, and then I'm going to talk about the guy I was going to talk about. Um, about Avatar The Last Airbender, because it is an amazing show. Um, and uh, one of the things that I enjoyed that it did, that told that teaches a lot about story and perspective, is um, a lot of shows will, a lot of animated series will have a recap episode where it goes back through like showing clips mm -hmm. of what has come before this episode. And usually it's before like some great big episode where you're gonna have to remember everything that came before because it's building on that. So for the recap episode of Avatar The Last Airbender, the characters are in enemy territory and they go to watch a play that is purportedly about their own adventures. <laughs> so you who have been there with them on their adventures know the true story of what happened. But their enemies tell the story of what happened on those same adventures very differently. <laughs> so it's 
extremely interesting because you get to see this you've seen the story as a truth and you see the story as it is being created by enemies into a legend that is going to be of you know a victory over these evil people who are your friends who you love mm -hmm. so that was really cool just getting getting to see how as brad said these people are going to be legends their stories are already starting to be told by others that they encounter so you're getting to see the spread of information and how they are being uh talked up but you also get to see how people who don't want their legend to continue who want them to fail want to spread the stories about them i'm not sure if i made sense but yes it was beautiful if you ever want to hear about perspective watch that series like for yes. that alone it was amazing going with what i was going to talk about before and then i'm going to add to it a completely separate thing <laughs> But first off, the legend, a fictional character who some people out there actually believe existed, which, you know, he was complete complete creation of imagination. But he created so many different, or gave us a lot of our modern science today, as well as, um, well, point blank, forensics. The whole entire science is of forensics. And the way police work is done, and so forth. And if anybody has not guessed it already... The one and only Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. Talk about a legend that continues to influence even today. And I, I am also surprised, a sidebar, that my friend Jen here did not mention another one, another story that we both know and love that relies, that creates its own legend as the story is told. In fact, in a way, I feel while this is unrelated of of a genre. I feel like the grand vampire because I've been told that once I got Jen involved, Jen hooked on this, now she's got a bunch of other people hooked on this, and it's like, oh, wow, okay, so I created this. I'm doing my very best. Yes, you are. Um, and that is Babylon 5. I'm also doing my best not to bring it up on every episode because people are going to think <laughs> I never watch anything else. Although I you do. Am, <laughs> you I watch am deep things? in a rewatch. Yeah. So I've been drawing some fan art while we were talking. Uh, <laughs> Amazing fan art. <laughs> yes. But if you ever watch Babylon 5, it is a tight, it does have its bloopers, but it is a really tightly written show, and it is basically a form of his own mythology. Well, it's, and it, plays is on others. it is a because myth. Because if you're, uh, if you want to back out to the actual, like, like, meta wiki and mm -hmm. look at it all, the show we're watching is actually a recreation by mm -hmm. in-universe TV based on Londo's biography. Yeah. That he what? publishes at the end of his life. So it's like, you're watching it, and you're watching it, and you're like, oh, well, this is what's happening. But then at the very end of the show, minor, minor spoiler alert, mm -hmm. they, they pull uh, a wise one on you, and they say, these portrayals are based on this book that's written by a in-universe character who probably looked nothing like the actor you're used to seeing, sounded nothing like the actor you're used to seeing, but he wrote this. And we made this for TV in this fictional futurized universe that you have enjoyed over the last five years. Thanks for watching. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so there's some meta universe lore for you. You're actually watching a fictionalized version of a fictionalized history. <laughs> and a lot of times that comes into play because, well, I'm just going to use some examples. Um, Babylon 5 takes some of its legend from this, but most it takes more of its legend from King Arthur. Um, we mentioned Tolkien before. He appears literally in the show at yeah. one point. <laughs> yeah, by the way, yes he does. Well, a, yeah, I'm going to watch hail, the show, you'll understand that. All hail Sir Jakar the Red. <laughs> yes. Um, we mentioned Tolkien with the Lord of the Rings. What I did not mention is Richard Wagner with his four... Um, Operas that are known as the Ring Cycle. The Nibelungen. Yes. The, the, the right. Song of the Nibelungs. And that all comes from one myth. And good luck finding the actual saga. Mm. It, it's a very short title. Don't worry. I lie. It is Vaskar the Vaslong and the Fall of a Nibelungen. Mm. And a lot of that, and also too, Harry Potter takes from it. The invisible cloak, the invisibility cloak, comes from that as well. Well, Harry Potter steals from a lot of places. Of course it it's, does. It's a compilation of and that's the fantasy's gonna, greatest hits. And that's where I was going to go <laughs> yes. with that, is mm -hmm. 
-hmm. A lot of the legends that we are creating today in our stories are built on legends or the concepts of legends that appeared before, and those are built on concepts of legends and mythologies. There's well, nothing new under the sun. Since we're well, talking about modern myths and like mm -hmm. myths that are derived from modern literature, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to take a moment to, to like thumb my nose at copyright law because copyright law has sort of, uh, it, and in a way it's kind of castrated the ability for Western modern mythology to grow. But uh, like take a moment to think about how many different versions of Alice in Wonderland you've seen recently. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Sherlock Holmes. He's a fantastic example. He's mm -hmm. the exact same thing. It's like before uh, copyright law extended for several generations post the death of the author, people were able to take these figures that everyone knows mm -hmm. uh, and continue to grow their story in almost a fireside retelling fairy tale way <coughs> and right. that's there's a lot you could i bet the the audience and the people here in the room with me can think of uh you know a dozen different modern myths that have been retold by different authors or or reprised and creative in different ways based on the original ideas yep <laughs> pride and prejudice and zombies that's a good example well, there's, there's Abraham lincoln vampire hunter another good example yeah. mentioned before the show I had to throw it out there. It, they're fictionalized versions <laughs> of things that exist. Fedora gave the most disgusted face <laughs> at Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. It was beautiful. But you should see his acrobatics. Yeah. I but actually watched the movie. I and There we go. And True confession. I'm going to get my head. Need times. some brain bleach. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to get rid of those images. <laughs> before I go over to Brad, a lot of that copyright law got created based on corporations who were selling who were oh. taking charge of Disney. It's the Thank you. I was doing Bono. cough it as well. I was going to cough it. The Sunny Memorial Mickey Mouse Law. Yes. It's all about keeping Mickey Mouse in Disney's clutches. They keep extending copyright so that no one steals Mickey Mouse from them because at this point his creator is dead and we're now looking at rights transferring post death of the author. Right. And just to go back to Sherlock Holmes that I'm not sure how long ago it was, but it is within living memory history that that went to court to prove that its copyright was now was no longer. Oh, well, that was fairly recent. Were not, they yeah, tried to do that again. Exactly. So go ahead, Brad. Uh, well, to throw it out there, we have modern myth that is kind of being created right now with all the comic books uh, that yep. are running around to the point where my guess is in a hundred years plus or so. You will probably have people who question whether or not Captain America really fought in World War II. <laughs> and, you know, whether or not Superman or Bat, you know, whether or not Batman ever was running around the streets of New York. Or Spider-Man zipping around through the uh, streets of New York. I say New York because people are Gotham. probably going to assume Gotham is New York. But, yeah. uh, you know, the, the point being is that at some point, these characters that we love and we go and see like crazy are going to evolve into some of the old characters that we hear about uh, today to the point where you wonder if uh, Paul Bunyan or if Johnny Appleseed or if uh, John Henry or any of these guys uh, were actually real people or not. You know, and how, what, uh, what did they actually do? Um, so, you know, it's, it'll be kind of intriguing in a hundred plus years to wonder, uh, you know, are people gonna wonder if the Winter Soldier was real? <laughs> Well, and along those lines, and then I'm going to go, I'm going to say two things, and I'm going to shoot over to Jennifer. Um, there is the story of George Washington and the cherry tree. Mm -hmm. People believed it happened. It didn't. It was a myth. But it, it just broke so many hearts, David. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm so sorry. Um, also, too, Star Wars. They, there are people, there's an actual church out there that exists. That is the Church of the Force or Church of the Jedi. Mm -hmm. and of course, they don't believe... You know, they can jump around, throw force lightning or anything else like that, but it's a concept that could be behind what George Lucas did. But they can hey, E.T. proves that uh, Star Wars and our world are in the exact same universe. <laughs> yes, it does. And on that, I'm going to turn it over to Jen. Uh, I don't want to open too big a can of worms, but you guys are welcome to run with this concept. Uh, yeah, we only this, have six minutes. Go yeah, ahead. this runs into like our what we're talking about now, the 
the mythologizing of our past. And now Brad's brought up the mythologizing of our present, basically. Uh -huh. Speculation into the future. I want to bring up the second episode of Futurama, in which they go to the moon, where there's a giant Disneyland-style uh, uh, theme park. Uh -huh. And one... The, the interpretation of the moon theme park of, um, version of It's a Small World After All is oh, called God. Whalers on the Moon, in which there's this running mythology of the future as seen in Futurama, because the whole philosophy of Futurama is that it's our world projected into the future, and that's where we're having the adventures with a kid who was frozen all that time and experiencing it brand new, is that... The moon actually did have whalers on it at some point. They sing a little song, and uh, and Fry, our main character, is real pissed off because he knows for a fact that there were no whalers on the moon. Ooh, the moon is just a rock. Mm -hmm. uh, but everyone around him is buying into it, and uh, his companions say something. I can't give you the quote exactly, but they say something along the lines of, yeah, but the lie is more fun. Hmm. So think about... Is like people are gonna look at you know, the Winter Soldier, uh, Spider Man, and Batman, and they're gonna think, "Yeah, that looks unrealistic." But maybe there was a real guy named Bruce Wayne who was super rich, who, who like took matters into his own hands, and then now it's Whalers on the Moon. Now we know him as Batman, and he's great. We've got all these legends about him. It's interesting to think about what in you know a hundred, two hundred, three hundred years. What we consider, well, of course not, you know. Of course the the legend of uh, Abraham Lincoln uh -huh. involves vampire slaying. It's in the historical texts. <laughs> well, I'm going to say point blank that your topic is quite possible. Let me throw a legend out there that people believe existed or did may, may have existed. Well, we don't even get, know that the legend did in certain ways exist. And helped create the Magna Carta, which helped create the Constitution of the United States. Yeah, and that is the legend of Robin Hood. Mm. Brad? <laughs> yeah, actually, I was going to throw out uh, Robin Hood is one. Uh, you could throw out King Arthur if you wanted to, because uh, he's a, a probable person of history. But the other one I was going to throw out is ask how many people out there think that the Three Musketeers are real. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right there. And you're going to get a lot of people who think those three guys were actually running around. Uh, and in reality, they weren't. But, um, you know, at this point, we're, you know, a couple hundred years later, and people aren't certain. Maybe, maybe there was a Athos, Porthos, and, you know, running around like crazy and stuff like that. So in the end, uh, it, it probably will be that Batman is considered to be real. And <laughs> people wonder if there was a house up in Westchester, New York, that, you know, where all the mutants lived. Uh -huh. And, by the way, then I'll go, because I know you're dovetailing, and then you've got a topic to bring us, I'm going to have Fedor finish us off, is in the case of the Three Musketeers, D'Artagnan is based on a real person. Yes. And but speaking of Alexandre Dumas' work, uh -huh. uh, the Count of Monte Cristo is based on his father. Yep. I know, that's the best story. <laughs> and Fedora closes out with Longfellow. Well, no, not about Longfellow exactly, but I think that the way that we get around this is to make sure that the upcoming generations have a decent grounding in what is real, what is possible, what is not. Mm -hmm. Because let's face it, we've had legends which were bigger than life from as far back as we have recorded history. Look at, for example, Homer's The Odyssey. But who is going to believe there were actually cliffs that clashed together? Mm -hmm. You see, it does not make sense. It doesn't make sense now. It didn't make sense then. It isn't true. And if we get people to the point where they can distinguish between what is reasonable, they can also make a distinction about what is likely to be true. Mm -hmm. yeah. And on that note, thank you for listening. Tune in next week for yet another interesting topic in the writing industry. Next week will be our 200th episode. Thank you for supporting us. The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her. Writers, agents, and publishers. 
for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the right pack. In this episode, we are going to talk about Longfellow and creating legends in your stories. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. 